Welcome to the video of a Slipper Orchid General Care Collab. I am absolutely impressed with how much response this Care Collab alert received. The inspiration for an entire Care Collab of Slipper Orchids generated from Nicole Allen, who asked me if I could do a video on how I care for my Slipper Orchids. However, Nicole Allen, <laughs> There are 18 other channels participating in this care collab and I thought it would just be wonderful to get as many, many options together so that you can make a decision whether my setup is conducive to your environment or whether there are other methods that might speak to you more. So all the links will be in the description below and I hope sincerely that I can do your question justice, not just with my video, but putting out all the opportunities and different variants into this care collab so that you have all the information you need and you can consolidate that to make your slipper orchid growing future a success. That being said, thank you everybody that responded to this care collab alert. Thank you so very much for participating, for your time, for joining in. And let me put it out there right away. Even though we now have 19 channels participating in this Care Collab, there has got to be more channels out there. So if you see this video, you grow slipper orchids, even if it's just one, and you make videos and you want to participate in future Care Collabs, please leave me a comment below. Let me get you on the database list. And you know what? It may not just be regarding slipper orchids. You may have a lot of orchids in common that are already on the database, and then we can expand and get you on the Care Collab initiative for as many orchids that are a direct match. Even with just one slipper orchid, let me know in the comments below. Let's get you on board for future updates. So here you see my collection of slipper orchids. Most of them are Paphia petalums. I have one Phragmopedium Garen Weaver over there to the right. One of them is missing out of this little gaggle grouping here because it is in bud. That is my mint chocolate and it is in bud for the first time. I'm a little bit hesitant to bring it out because I don't want that bud to blast. It has taken almost three years to get it to this point. I'm just going to correct myself really quickly. Ha! I got a newcomer here. I have not got that one on the table either because it's recovering, it is acclimating, and I don't want to move it around too much because upon potting it up into the setup that I have, it only had one root, so it stays put. And that is my Paphiopedum gratrixianum, which I got from Fernanda Nascimento Orchids and Succulents, who's also participating in this care collab. And possibly hers looks a darn slight better than mine, but mine is coming on. That is why it's not on this display. And that brings me to the point of growth habit. <laughs> Slipper orchids are slow. Who knew? but I happen to have other orchids that are much slower, so they seem more vigorous than other orchids I have in my collection. They are slow to grow, but once they mature and become flowering size, they are consistent in their flowering year after year, and they will always produce a bloom on the new fan that they grow. But most importantly, what I find as a total beginner for my slipper orchid growing career, which really is a total beginner, I only started growing these beauties three years ago, is the fact that when a fan starts to die back, do not panic. That is normal. When you see leaves yellowing like that, do not panic. That is normal. If that leaf is from a very old fan as opposed to coming out of a new growth, which is healthy, green, and lush. On any slipper orchids, the old fans will always die back. And thankfully, that sunburn there on my Paphiopetalum Iona is on an old fan. So that will die back and it will take the blemish away and the orchid will look fine again. So first of all, panic not if you see yellowing leaves on your orchids. If they're coming from older fans, that is normal. Those fans die back because the new fans are going to be the future of the orchid and those are the ones that are going to bloom. However, you see my little Delenatii over there. It's been three years since this orchid has been with me. I have not had it bloom yet. 
The last time I thought that this leaf that was coming out new, I thought, yep, that is a bloom, a bud coming out. Uh, no, it isn't. It's a beautiful new leaf. Now, let me show you something about this orchid and what I've learned from the experience in the past regarding their growth habit using the Delanati. You see how low I have it in the pot? And that is for a specific reason. These slipper orchids have such strong, sturdy roots that when they are happily growing in the pot, literally the roots will lift the orchid out of the pot. And what cannot happen because they are semi-terrestrial is that any new roots coming out of the pot do not have immediate access to water. So there is a fine balance between where the media ends and the base of the orchid starts. First of all, the fine balance is you want to avoid rotting the base, but you also want to avoid drying out any of the new roots that come out of the base. So Delanatia came to me a little bit later in my collection after I had practiced with my complex hybrid over here. That was my first ever slipper orchid. And I noticed how my complex hybrid was just going up and up and up in the pot, but I don't want to disturb them too much. In my setup with Lekka and Self watering, I don't want to be messing around with slipper orchids every single year because my media doesn't break down. I don't have to make that change. So in order to counteract any possible rising out of the pot and intervening too soon, the base of the orchid is flush with the media, but the orchid itself is much lower in the pot because anticipating that it's gonna be in here for a long, long time because of the inorganic media, I am waiting for it to raise itself out of the pot, which means there's a lot of root growth in the pot. And then I can keep filling around to make sure that the media stays flush with the base of the orchid. That is what I did here with my Delanatii on purpose to somehow not have to always interfere with repotting and lowering the orchid back down so that the roots that come out don't desiccate and dry out. Slipper orchids are terrestrial, semi-terrestrial, lithophytes. However, when the new roots grow, they want to go straight into media or straight into water or your humidity is extremely high. They cannot dry out because that would be the end of that root. From my observation in general, the roots of slipper orchids, you might get one root or two roots per fan, depending on what species you have. Thankfully, hybrids are a little bit more forgiving and a lot more vigorous when it comes to blooming. If, as I was experimenting for the first time ever with a slipper orchid, I bought myself a rescue American hybrid and it is thriving also in Lekka and self-watering. It has not been repotted since I put it into that setup, but you can see there on the base how the Lekka is very, very uneven and how it is some somewhat rising up out of the pot but as long as the base of the fans, the new fans, is still flush and snug up against the medium, any new roots will work and find their way down. The same here with my Phragmopedium. This one was cleaned up heavily during the past summer of 2021, and I put it lower into the pot as well, anticipating that it will rise up and out of the pot because this one is a vigorous root grower which is great. There's a lot, a lot of activity in this pot. You can see how the lecker is already uneven and you can see where the new fans are growing out. And you can see as well that this leaf that is looking nasty, that is an old fan. Now the older fans will die back whether they will bloom or not. So the rejuvenation process of any slipper orchid is as new growths grow, even though they're a little bit separated from where the previous fan is, the old fans will die back whether they've bloomed or not. I have abused my Phragmopedium Garen Weaver for the past 12 months and I didn't give it enough flushing and watering care because this one happens to be in a semi-hydro setup, classic semi-hydro setup whereas the majority of my slipper orchids are in Lekka and self-watering, or as in the case of my Delenatii, you can see that I have sprinkled Akadama on the surface 
to maintain humidity in my extremely hot climate and it is very dry, I don't have humidity. So instead of using sphagnum moss to counteract that humidity around the base of the orchid, I went with Akadama because that too will not break down in my climate but it retains a lot of moisture and humidity. That is where the roots will then start to grow out and find their way into the pot. So you see where I'm getting at with my setup. And that is why this Care Collab for me is so important because I have a one-stop shop kind of method for Phragmopediums as well as Paphiopedilums. It is all LECA and self-watering with the added little bit of difference depending on what orchid I am dealing with. In this case, it's a very tiny little bilatulum that I am really babying and hoping that it'll pull through because the mother plant died back after I exposed it to too much sun. Here is a tiny little fighter. And this one is an Akadama and Grit. Slipper orchids do not like to dry out per se, but they do not like their media soggy either. So it's a fine line between keeping them evenly moist as opposed to a wet dry cycle with other orchids. And that is why also the size of the orchid will depend on the size of the media you're using. A standard slipper orchid, let's say like the American hybrid over there, has big fleshy chunky roots. And then I use big LECA for that. But I have to flush a lot to maintain the oxygen flow through the pots and make sure that the roots do not come up against any lecker that is somewhat drying out, which could potentially then desiccate my roots. Same with the smallest one there. I have to go with a more higher water retentive media, but I wanna break that down and not make it suffocating for the roots. And that is why I used grit to break down the consistency and the water retentiveness of Akadama, allowing oxygen to the roots and a free flow through the media when I flush. Using Akadama as my humidity buffer is also something I've used successfully with my Delanati, but I've also used microfiber to make sure that this one, and this is my Lindley Kupowitz, and you'll see water pouring out, and we'll get to that. This one has never been repotted since it came into my collection. Reliable bloomer, but you can see the roots coming out the top there. You can also see how uneven the leka is and how high the leka is. And this is where I'm talking about how slipper orchids push themselves above the level of the media because of the amount of roots that are in the pot. So this is a good sign, but we need to make sure that this doesn't get out of hand. So instead of putting Akadama around the top of this one, I have used a microfiber because underneath this microfiber, sorry for jiggling, the pot is quite heavy, there is a root that I'm trying to maintain and protect and until such a time I'm ready to address this orchid and repot her. But for three years, and she is lifting herself out of the pot. So my Delanatii concept is working really well because as she lifts herself out of the pot, it's gonna take forever and my inorganic media is not gonna break down. I can keep her that way. But let's get on to why that pot was so heavy. <laughs> right now, everybody, well, minus the two that are in the semi-hydro, but everybody is sitting in fresh RO water, a sort of a soak, a flush, if you would like to call it that. But I'm not flushing heavily at this point in time because of the time of year. However, I do not want my leka to lose the efficacy of the wicking effect throughout the winter months where I'm trying to baby them through. So these get a good soak every two weeks this time of year, and I'm talking November through to March, they get a good soak, but not to the base of the orchid. Let me use my Gloria Nago to show you this example. The pot is full of water. The mask is filled but you don't see any kind of water at the surface. If I tilt it, you will see it coming out here. Now in the past, I have made a mistake with flushing and that being in the summer. Flushing a lot, being very aggressive with how I keep the flushing process going, letting the water rise to the top, letting it drain as you do. However, considering that the base is so low in the pot, I thought I was gonna be safe in the summer and you know, whatever happens in the bracts here isn't a problem. 
That was a big mistake. That was a learning curve. It didn't matter the time of year, how hot it was, how much airflow there was. I lost a few of my paphia pedalums because my flushing surfaced all the way to the base of the bracts and they didn't dry out and they rotted out, which was a shame. So now what I do is I don't flush as vigorously anymore, but I do soak the pot with just plain RO water and I never ever let it rise to the top just to protect the base of the orchid and hopefully not make the same mistake again as I did with other paths that I've lost in the past. So let's talk about light because the Latulum baby up there lost its mother plant because of my mistake with regards to giving too much light. When it comes to these mottled orchids, especially when they have a kind of a texture to them, they feel a little bit fuzzy. That includes my Paphiopedalum Iona, even though she doesn't look like it. There's a fuzz to them. Well, you can see the sunburn here. Like I said, not too bothered. It's on an old fan. It's gonna die back anyway, but Bilatulum's mum died because I missed the mark with how much sun these mottle leaf pedalums can take. I burnt two or three leaves, which I thought was a slight burn on the mother plant and she promptly declined. So all my slipper orchids are kind of scattered around, something I don't really like. I want everything, you know, a set together so I can take care of them, but their light requirements are all different. The Paphiopedalum American Hybrid can tolerate direct sun for a certain amount of time per day, as long as there's airflow. But anything mottled, anything with a fuzzy texture, that is the detriment to the orchids if they get burnt. So everybody is scattered around according to their light requirements. Nobody is in the same place. My Phragmopedium, for example, gets a lot, a lot of light, but never direct sun if I can help it. And my Phragmopedium lives outside in my climate here in Southern Spain all year round. So the temperatures, the variables that I'm giving my Phragmopedium, for example, is a five degrees Celsius margin all the way up to the heat of the summer, which can be 40 degrees Celsius. The others always and permanently live indoors. Their different locations have a different light requirement based on what they like. But my indoor temperatures will only range between 15 degrees Celsius all the way up to when we really get into summer and I've got hot, hot days with dry winds. Indoors, it can get to 40 degrees, but that is not the norm. I'm usually around the 35 degrees centigrade mark indoors. So their temperature tolerance is quite, quite incredible. I find that the majority requirement when it comes to high temperatures which can happen throughout a heat wave is airflow. Watering and flushing in my case as per the setup and airflow. And then they can really, really tolerate high temperatures. What they will not tolerate, even if there is airflow, is direct sun. And another thing is I don't have any humidity to speak of. So my setup kind of counteracts that a little bit. The fact that there is Lekka self-watering, the humidity around each pot is a little bit more increased. The dehydration and the transpiration through the leaves is also a little bit more reduced. And this is why I have like a one-stop shop for all my slipper orchids because of my climate. When I saw my first little American hybrid, little one, it's one of the biggest ones I've got, doing so well in Lekka and self-watering, it really gave me courage and a boost in my confidence that I can get more of them because this is how they can grow. So let me put the setup into perspective here. Lekka and self-watering was invented for terrestrial plants, indoor growing, and it was the cleaner method of growing house plants. So when I hear orchid, terrestrial, semi-terrestrial, in my head, it is a no-brainer that it should work. Seeing as the concept itself was invented for house plants, an orchid that has the terrestrial, semi-terrestrial features, even lithophytes, I mean, we're talking little rocky things for the roots, it works. So I'm really glad that in this case, I can stay consistent throughout with my setup, that none of them are requiring something specific or special, and that the Lekka self-watering or Lekka semi-hydro is absolutely adequate with one disclaimer. Do not ignore the flushing. 
especially the flushing of an orchid that can live outside like my Phragmopedium all year round. Flushing, flushing, flushing because otherwise ants may find themselves quite comfortable in that setup as well. And having a colony of ants in a pot means there is not enough water going through. And that is exactly what happened to me this past year. It was a first and yes, I was ashamed. <laughs> The orchid looked so much worse six months ago, but here we are. She is doing well and recovering. And last night, even she got herself a fresh dose of rain, which I'm not bothered with. Cold temperatures, rain, Phragmopedium, Garen Weaver, not an issue. Sometimes they're completely submerged in water. So I don't care if there anything goes into the crown. Absolutely no problem. And that's why she's outside all year round and doing really well. A very, very vigorous orchid on the root front. So speaking of roots, of course, that is our major factor. We have to baby them. And the more we flush, the more oxygen we put through the pot, which means then more root growth. My fertilizing mistakes from these guys were very, very interesting. Because I thought I was in a warmer climate, I thought my slipper orchids would grow faster. So I thought I could up the fertilizer concentration simply because I'm matching a growth habit potential in my environment. Wrong, absolutely and totally wrong. I have reduced fertilizer to next to nothing. I do not use a lot of MSU fertilizer. I do not use a lot of calcium and magnesium. The only thing I use a lot of is seaweed. And I put seaweed into their pots starting spring through summer at 40 parts per million at 5.8 pH because of my LECA. And because most slipper orchids, this being a general care, most slipper orchids like to have a more acidic climate around their roots. So 5.8 goes into my pot, a lot of seaweed to help increase with the growth, the branching and roots, etc. Very, very conservative on anything else. If I, for example, flush my orchids through on a regular basis, I will soak them in some fertilizer that is at 100 parts per million equivalent to what I fertilize my tolumnias at. But then I will empty the mask and I will flush out whatever is around the roots with plain RO water and then settle them back into a reservoir with just plain RO water. That is how conservative I am because I have had leaf tip dieback from fertilizer burn simply assuming my warmer climate would trigger faster growth. That is not the case at all. The only thing that my warmer climate permits me is to let my Phragmopedium Garen Weaver live outdoors all the time, but it does not grow any faster because of my warmer climate, if that makes sense very conservative on the fertilizer, but they still grow well and they're still blooming well. My Paphiopedala miona here, for example, is already working on buds right there. And there's another one. Somewhere in here, maybe I'll get a third one. But I'm telling you, if the average fertilizer throughout the year is 100 parts per million, per month, that is exaggerating. So just to give you an idea and a perspective of how little I fertilize these guys. So let's just go through some blooms. I've never had Gloria Noggle bloom for me. Can't show you that. I have had Lindley Kupowitz bloom for me every single year that she's been with me. And I bring this up right after the topic of fertilizing because she blooms for me every single year regularly and doesn't seem to have any deficiencies even though her fertilizer levels are so low. Gloria Nagel has increased fantastically with her fan count and last year for the first time I had three blooms in one go despite low fertilizer levels. Waiting for Delanatii to bloom for me. First time ever bloomer this year in 2021. My Spicerianum, even low fertilizer. Little Bellatulum is doing fabulous, growing the way it's growing, and I am absolutely not applying any fertilizer to that one. All it gets is some seaweed just to encourage the one root I think I've got in there. So you see how throughout all of these that have bloomed for me, 
and the ones that I'm waiting to bloom, none of them have not bloomed because I haven't been applying fertilizer. On the contrary, they have been growing so, so well because I think they didn't get the fertilizer and I left them to it. So to wrap this up, if you are in doubt with regards to my setup, Lekka and self-watering, just let me tell you that for me, it has worked superbly. Once I took out what I thought was the complicated part of slipper orchids, I literally stripped their growing requirements to the bare minimum of pot, media, water, light. <laughs> and it's working. But I know, Nicole Allen, that maybe not everybody has similar conditions and climate. So if you've made it this far, I'm looking at the time on my camera here and I'm like going, wow, I didn't think I could talk so much about something that was so simple. But I needed to explain how I came about my conclusions and give you a background instead of just throwing the information out there and saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. And haha, here we go. My mistakes have brought me to this point and that is why I think it's very relevant to bring that up to understand why I'm not fertilizing a lot, but yet I'm still getting results because I did fertilize a lot and I gave them a lot more light and I paid the consequences for it. And there really is no need because since I've stopped doing all these radical things, thinking that I'm doing great for my orchids, too much love, so to speak, they're still blooming, they're still growing and they're looking better than ever. 18 more videos to watch and maybe hopefully in the future a lot more channels will be participating in our slipper orchids general care now i am super excited to spend a lot of time going to all the videos in the description below watching them and seeing what information i can glean out of them and see all the different types of media the setups the environment etc and you will see how diverse the different methods can be yet the results speak for themselves that everything with slipper orchids is possible the only thing is you cannot speed up their growth pattern and if that is frustrating let me tell you once again i've got orchids in my collection that are much slower than the slipper orchids so <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody that has joined in on this care collab. I really appreciate the response and I hope, I hope that moving forward, this care collab grouping will give a lot of information to a lot of people out there looking to see how they can care for slipper orchids in general, just to get people started. Have yourselves a beautiful, beautiful day on one condition, stay safe and take care. Bye.